Welcome to Lesson 2.7 on Applications and Models Using Trigonometric Functions. <clears throat> I'm going to go through two examples with you and show you how to set up the problem in a way so that you can write the trig equation, the trig model that you're being asked for. And then when you go through your review problems in preparation for the test, you're going to see a few of these types of problems on that review. So that's how you will be practicing today. There's no separate practice for this lesson. So if you turn in your books to your notes page for 2.7, you'll notice that it's asking you to go back to our bike information from earlier in this chapter. Well, the information we're going to be using is this problem that we saw back in the 2.2b practice. Okay, and if you remember, just a quick review here, we've got one circle here that is connected to the pedals of our bicycle. So this is what the cyclist is rotating around. That has a chain that is connected to the sprocket, the middle wheel here, on our big wheel, our bicycle wheel. So as this circle rotates, it's causing this circle to rotate, which then of course causes our bicycle wheel to rotate. And we have some information here, which we can also see in the diagram, which is that the radius of the pedal wheel was four inches, the radius of this inside wheel was 2 inches, and the radius of this entire wheel is 14 inches. We're also being told that the cyclist is pedaling at a rate of 1 revolution per second. Okay, That's going to be important information for us to come back to in just a minute for what we're going to do today. So in the previous problem, we were asked to figure out what would the speed of the bicycle be under these conditions. Today, the problem is just a little bit different. So today we want to imagine that a pebble gets caught in the tire while you're riding the bike. So what would be the equation that represents the height of the pebble off the ground as you ride? Okay. We're going to write an equation that represents the height of the pebble off of the ground as the cyclist continues to ride. Okay, so we're imagining that this pebble gets stuck in the tire right here. Okay, it's going to stay stuck in the tire as the cyclist continues to ride. So it's going to rotate around as the tire rotates. So the first thing to help us set this up so that we can write the, e the equation is to try to sketch a graph of what's happening in terms of the height of this pebble with respect to time. Okay, so just a quick little graph here. where my x-axis is going to represent time and my y-axis is going to represent the height of the pebble. Okay, so when time is zero at the moment where the pebble gets stuck in the wheel, what is the height of the pebble? Well, since it's getting stuck right here on the ground, our height is going to be Zero, right there. Okay? Now, think about this. As my wheel rotates, what is happening to the height of the pebble? So what is my distance from the ground? Okay? Well, I think you can see here that as the wheel rotates as the cyclist continues to ride, the pebble is going to increase in its height above the ground. And even as I'm up here, we're talking about height from the ground, 
height from the ground, okay, until we get up here. And then at this point, as we continue to rotate, the height is going to start to diminish again. So the pebble is going to start getting closer and closer and closer to the ground. So just a quick general sketch. It doesn't have to be really exact. It's just to give us an idea. But on a two-dimensional time versus height kind of graph, my graph is going to look like this. My pebble is getting higher, 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 higher up to a certain point, And then it comes down lower, lower, lower until it reaches back down to the ground again. Okay. All right, so what we have here now is basically a trig function. We have just graphed something that looks very much like what we've been graphing the past couple of days. So what we need to do is to try to figure out those main pieces of A and P and H and K. Because if we can figure out these pieces, then we can figure out what the function should be. Okay, so <clears throat> let's start putting some information together here. First of all, let's talk about A. Well, in order to figure out A, since A is amplitude and amplitude is the distance from the sinusoidal axis to a max or min point, I need to know where the sinusoidal axis is. So I really actually need to think about k here first. So let's talk about distance. How far up is my pebble going to get? What's the maximum distance away from the ground that my pebble can get here? Well, if I'm rotating around this bike wheel, and my bike wheel has a radius of 14 inches, then it would make sense my maximum distance away would be a 28. Okay, so right here we're at 28 inches. That also means then that halfway is where my sinusoidal axis has to be. And halfway between 0 and 28 is going to be 14. So in this case, it actually just ends up being the radius of the wheel. Okay? Let's see if I can clear this up just a little bit. There you go. Hopefully that will make it easier to see. All right, so we know it's a total distance of 28 that my pebble can go up. Halfway in between is going to be 14. That's where my sinusoidal axis is going to be. So that's also going to give me my k value. Okay? All right, so my k value is 14 because I moved up that much. Now for my distance from the sinusoidal axis to the max point, that is also going to be 14 in this case. So I've got 14 for amplitude. However, is this going to be positive or negative 14? Well, for that, we have to go back and decide what type of trigonometric graph seems to fit best here. Well, at my y-axis, I'm starting here at a min point. So that seems like cosine would be the best fit. But since it's at a min point, that means that my amplitude is going to have to be negative. So I now have an A value of negative 14. OK? All right, so what about the period? What do I know about how long it took to make one rotation around the wheel? Well, that's where this information comes in. It told us that the cyclist was pedaling 
at a rate of one revolution per second. So that was this wheel. This wheel goes around once in one second. But remember, because my radius on this little wheel where the chain is connected is half as much as this one, it means that one rotation of this wheel is actually going to cause two rotations of this wheel. So if I've got two revolutions in one second, then that means one revolution is only going to take half of a second. So from here to here took one half of a second. And this now becomes my period. Okay, that's the amount of time that it took to get through one full rotation. So if my period is one half, then I can find my B value by taking 2 pi over 1 half, which ends up being 4 pi. Okay? And then for the H value, we're starting right here at a midpoint. There's no shift to the left or the right, and so we're just going to use 0 there. Okay, so now that I know all of the pieces, I should be able to put this together into a final equation. So my function is that f of x equals a, negative 14, times the cosine of b, 4 pi, times x, with no h added or subtracted, and then plus my k value of 14. So this is the trigonometric equation that represents the height of the pebble as it rotates around the wheel as the cyclist continues to ride. Negative 14 cosine 4 pi x plus 14. Okay. Now, if you didn't quite catch all that, go ahead and pause the video for a second and go back and rewind, rewatch that part, and make sure that you understand how we're going to get all of these pieces. The biggest suggestion I can make to you is to first draw a quick sketch of what's happening. Because from the sketch, you should be able to figure out the pieces you need to make your function. Okay, let's take a look at another example. This one is also in your notes page. There's another problem that's at the bottom of the page, but we're not going to look at that problem for right now. We're just going to look at the spring problem. All right, so here's the situation. It says to consider a ball that is bobbing up and down on the end of a spring as shown in the figure. Okay? So here, we're calling this equilibrium because the ball is, is not bouncing at this point. So when it's just sitting there, hanging there, it's not bouncing, it's not moving, we call that equilibrium. And notice, we're also calling that zero centimeters. Okay? When the spring is stretched, we're told that we're to suppose that 10 centimeters is the maximum distance the ball moves vertically upward and downward from its equilibrium or at rest position. So when it's stretched all the way out as far as it's going to go, that means that we're at negative 10 centimeters. We're 10 centimeters down from our resting place. And then when it the bounces back up, it bounces back up as high as 10 centimeters above our resting place, and so that's positive 10 centimeters. Okay? It says to suppose further that the time it takes for the ball to move from its maximum displacement above zero, so that's here, 
<clears throat> excuse me, to its maximum displacement below zero, down to here, is t equals four seconds. So it takes four seconds for it, for it to bounce from here down to here, back again, to get from its max to its min. Okay? Assuming the ideal conditions of perfect elasticity and no friction or air resistance, write a trigonometric model for the displacement position up and down <clears throat> of the ball as a function of time if the ball starts at its highest position. All right, so what would this graph look like? Here's my y-axis. It's going to represent displacement. Okay? Displacement is just a fancy word that kind of means the distance <clears throat> away from where you started. Okay, and we're starting at zero, which is right here in the middle. So this time I'm going to draw my horizontal axis through the middle of my vertical axis. And it's still going to represent time. Okay, so we're being told that the ball is going to start at its maximum displacement and then as you let go okay if you let go of the ball the spring is going to start going down and then it's going to come back up and then it's going to go down and so our graph over time is going to look something like this Okay, so what kind of graph are we dealing with this time? Well, it again looks a lot like a cosine graph because this time we're starting at a maximum point and then we dip down and we come back up to that maximum point. All right, what about A, P, H, and K for this one? Well, if this is zero, we're told that the minimum displacement goes all the way down to a negative 10. So there's negative 10. And maximum displacement goes all the way up to a positive 10. Okay. So if we start putting some numbers together. Our k value this time is actually right here at 0. Okay, because we're starting, or our zero is at equilibrium. We go up and down from there. So we're actually going to be using our x-axis as our sinusoidal axis. So k will be zero. Our h value is also going to be zero because we're not moving left or right at all. We're starting right here at a max point, just like we would expect with cosine. So h is also going to be zero. Our a value is going to be the distance from the sinusoidal axis up to a max point or down to a min point. That distance is a distance of 10 and it's going to be positive this time because I'm actually starting at a max point just like cosine normally does. So I don't need to flip it over by making a a negative. We're going to go positive 10 for our a value. Now, as far as our p-value goes, the time information we were told is that the ball is going to move from its maximum displacement above zero to its maximum displacement below zero in four seconds. So that means from here to here took four seconds. which means if I then go back up again to get back to here to complete one full circle, it would have taken a total time of eight seconds. So that means my period to get through one full rotation is going to be eight seconds. That will give me my B value 
by taking 2 pi over 8, and I get pi over 4. Okay, so now if we put all the pieces together, our function for this ball on the end of a spring is going to be f of x equals 10 cosine pi over 4 x and then no h or k so we're done this is our function okay so anytime you have an object that is going through a repetitive motion, whether it's up and down on a spring like this, whether it's going around in a circle like on a bicycle. Okay, we'll do it this way so you can see what I'm talking about. Um, but that repetitive motion means that trigonometry is the best way to represent it. And so if you go through the process of drawing yourself a sketch of what's happening, and then using the information they give you to start labeling that sketch. And then from the sketch, figure out your A, P, H, and K. P then giving you your B value. You should be able to take all of that and write your function. So when you get to these types of problems on your review, this is the process you should be going through. The rest of the problems on your review should be like things that we've seen in our other six lessons, which is really more because some of our lessons were divided up into two parts. And so whatever time you have left today in class, you can start working on that review. Uh, what you don't get done in class should be your homework over the weekend. And you want to come in Tuesday ready to take your chapter two test. We'll have a few minutes at the beginning of class to ask questions, so if anything's causing you any trouble, make sure you make a note of it and be ready to ask those questions on Tuesday before the test. All right, that's it for today. We'll see you on Tuesday. Have a good weekend, guys.